Hello and welcome back. So today I'm looking at the UART again. The UART I've built has got the basic functionality we need to be able to make use of it. So I've got the receive circuit and the transmit circuit all wired into the CPU. But I've got no buffering on it. What that means is as I push keys on the keyboard for the terminal, we see the data change here. But if the CPU doesn't get around to reading that data before I press another key, then that data is lost. And of course, if it was transmitting data faster, the CPU needs to respond quicker and quicker. And we've actually got quite a decent bitrate on this. So we'd have to focus on receiving data with the CPU in order to not miss anything if we were trying to transfer a decent amount. The cursor keys on the console are actually sending several bytes as a key code, and I'm only actually paying attention to the last byte because I'm pretty much guaranteed to uh, lose the first couple. So to solve this problem, what we need to do is add a bit of buffering to the UART, and that will help us with both sending and receiving. So let's have a look at what kind of buffer would help us out and how to build one. Okay, the last type of data structure I looked at closely was a LIFO buffer, what's commonly called a stack. But for the input and output buffer from the UART, we need a different type of buffer, and that's a FIFO buffer, first in, first out. And that has a common name of a queue. In this case, we have either bits of data being transmitted one after another, in which case we want them to be dispatched in the order we give them to the system, or we've got bytes of data being received and we want to process them in the order they're received, hence the name first in, first out. So if we imagine some data items that are in the buffer and we've just received a new byte of data we want to insert into it, then we perform the addition operation. Now this term NQ is probably just a programming term, but I'm going to stick with the terminology I'm familiar with. When pulling a data item out of the structure, this is what we'd call a DQ operation, and we're taking that off the opposite end. So in the case of the UART, a received byte would be enqueued onto the front, and then when the CPU takes a byte, it would be the DQ operation. Or on the opposite side of the UART, when the CPU sends a byte, that would be an NQ, and then when the UART is actually able to transmit it, that would be a DQ. So the next thing is to think about how we're actually going to physically implement that within a computer. In programming, the way we would normally implement this is with something called a circular queue. Let's imagine a set of data slots that, there could be any number of them, but the idea is that this would be a fixed size. And we maintain two pointers into this data structure, which is the write location and the read location. When I enqueue an item, I write it into the write location and move the pointer forward, and we can repeat this. The write location is pointing to the next place where a data item is going to go, and the read location is pointing to the next place we're going to read from. So then if we perform a DQ operation, we take the data item, and then the read pointer moves forward. Now, why is this called a circular queue? Imagine these data items are literally arranged in a circle. Now when we store them in memory, we just have a linear array from a, a starting position, but we allow the indexes into that array that represented with the read and write pointers. We allow those values to wrap. So when it gets to the end, we bring it back to the start. So now when we write the next data item, the write pointer moving on is actually going back to the start. Now we can calculate the number of items that are actually in the structure just by looking at the difference between the read and write pointer locations. So if we simply subtract them, but allow that value to wrap in the same way that the pointers themselves wrap, then that subtraction gives us the number of data items within the buffer. Okay, I don't want to spend too long on looking at pictures. Let's, uh, let's see if we can build one of these as a circuit. Okay. So I've got a couple of clean new breadboards to start work on this buffer. Also got this test circuit, which I think might be handy for producing some signals. Now to start with, we need to think about how we're gonna store those read and write pointers. So I'm gonna make use of these 74LS193 chips. These are the counters that I used in the address registers in the processor build. So I've got lots of these lying around. Need to get this master reset held down. But that parallel load needs to be held up. 
don't need to worry about the outputs for carry or the inputs for presetting. We are going to hold the down count high and the count up. We can take it from the nearest button. All right, let's get some LEDs set up. So now uh, impulse here increments the counter. So this is advancing the right pointer. Let's duplicate this out. So we've got a read pointer on this button. We need to turn this into something that can index a position in the buffer. I'm going to use these 74LS138 3 to 8 line decoders. Now, the counters are 4 bit counters, and these are free input bits, but for this particular circuit, I think I'm going to create a buffer with four bytes in it. And so we can drop those lines down a little bit. So these bottom two bits of the index, if we drive them into the first two bits of our decoder, and then just bring that third input low. Now, when I design a PCB for this circuit, I'm going to expand it back out to the eight bytes of buffer space that would fit nicely in the capabilities of this chip. And for various reasons, I'll maybe touch on a bit later, having, having four bits in the index calculation, but only three bits actually used does confer a couple of small advantages. So eight bytes is ideal for this circuit without adding any extra complexity. I need to do the same with the inputs over here. Or the third input low. Now we've got these enable inputs. The active high enable, just bring that directly high. And then we've got two active low enables. So now in theory, these should be cycling through four output lines or the first four output lines from the decoder. Okay, it is, but these are active low outputs, so we'd be better off switching this around. Okay, so here is our write pointer and our read pointer. And these, of course, would be the appropriate signals from the CPU or from the rest of the circuit. Now we've got more circuitry to build here and then we're going to actually need to add in the chips to store the data and even just for four bytes that's going to start taking up the entirety of this board and so the eight byte buffer i'd like to build is going to end up being probably a minimum of three breadboards to have a read and a write buffer that would mean six additional breadboards which would be a massive increase to the size of the uart so what i actually would like to do is finish designing this circuit with just four bytes of data but then turn it into a pcb as a tiny little module that we can sit on a breadboard and add both a read and a write buffer to the UART circuit without taking up a vast amount of space. So what I'd like to do is build the, at least the circuit diagram as we go. All right, so here's the counter chip and the demultiplexer. Right, now these carry lines we don't want. And these preload data lines, we don't want either. Count down line, we just want to hold that high. And our data right line for now just goes to count up. Okay, these address lines, they go into the demultiplexer. Okay, the active high enable, we're just going to tie up. 
and the active low ones we can bring low. Okay, now this master reset. On the breadboard at the moment, we've just tied that low. But I think we're going to want to be able to access that later. So let's put a net label on it. And all of these outputs we're going to want. I don't think we're going to use that parallel load functionality, so I can just hardwire that high. OK, so that's our right counter and decoder done for now. So the only real difference between this and the version we've built on the breadboard is we've wired up all three address bits to here, and we're taking out eight rather than four right lines. Now the read is just going to be a copy of this for now with the appropriate renaming. OK, that's done. OK, now instead of trying to read these outputs and, and see which ones we're using, what we actually need to do is calculate the number of bytes that are stored in the buffer because the UART of the CPU in our use case are going to want that information. So we said that to find out how many bytes are in the buffer, we need to subtract the read address from the write address. So this is a 74LS283, which is an adder. It's exactly the same one as we used in the ALU for the processor. So you can see a bit more about it in that video. OK, so the first thing I'd like to do is get a kind of output display. Inputs and the outputs on these adders seem particularly odd. But as long as we pay attention, we shouldn't make any mistakes. Right, so we want to subtract this from this. So let's put this in as the A input. I'm just grabbing all the B inputs here. And then lastly, we've got this carry input, which we will bring low for now. So we're currently adding the right address and zero. We're basically seeing the right address unimpeded here. So it's consistent with what we're seeing. But obviously, when we move on to four here, it wraps back to the start. This chip is an adder, not a subtractor. So what we're going to do is take the value over here and turn it into the twos complement form. And for that, we're going to need to invert all the bits and then add one to the result. So this is a 74LS04, which is six inverters. So we'll take those six output bits. So bit one. Bit two, bit three, and bit four. And to complete the two's complement operation, we need to add one, which we can just use this carry input for. OK, the other thing I want to do is take these clear lines, tie them together. And let's use another one of these to turn it into an active low, like all our other reset signals are. And grab this from the button over here. OK, that's good. So we're going to store a data item. So number of items stored is one. Right address has moved on. Second one, so it's now two. And we're going to read one off, so it's now one. And the read address has moved forward. So in effect, this button and this button are incrementing and decrementing the value here respectively. But then these LEDs are showing us the read and write addresses, whereas this LED is showing the number of bytes in the buffer. OK, that's pretty cool. Right, let's update the EDA circuit with this. OK, Daniel Egg, whoever you are, thanks for adding that.
Okay, so there's the outputs. So this is the count of the total number of data items in. Now, because with the breadboard circuit, we're going to peak out at four, but with this version, we're going to peak out at eight. We do need the four output bits so we can output the full range that we need. A inputs are all going to be the right address. No need of that carry output. Carry input is just going to be pulled high. So that's the plus one of the two's complement calculation for the subtraction on B. And we need the inverter for that. Which I didn't get. That's what I wanted. What we're going to call these. Right, so B0, B1, B2, and B3. And the other thing is we used a spare one of these to create a reset line that was active low. We currently have an unused input that we best set appropriately. And there our circuit's caught up with the breadboard again. Okay, now this is going to be a tough piece of wiring. Now to actually store data, I'm going to use the 74LS574 latch chips used lots of these in the build so far. So I want the final form of this to have eight, but wiring up eight of these is more than I want to do on a breadboard. Right, so what I want to do is tie together all of the inputs and all of the outputs. So we've basically got an input bus and an output bus. Prepped lots of wires for doing this. Okay, let's see how easy this is going to be. This particular type of breadboard is sometimes very difficult to get the wires in. And apparently sometimes very difficult to get them out. These purple lines are at output. So if this is a read, our output enables are actually on this side. It's the loads on this side. We're not doing anything with the load lines at the moment, nor are we giving them any data. Switch to yellow for the load lines because I've got some longer ones. Okay, now we need to get the input data connections up. This is a little 3D printed form I used to create all of these wires. So I just cut all the lengths to the correct size and then folded them around here and cleaned the ends off. It did make it a lot easier to create a whole bunch of similar cables. Some days on the breadboard builds, I'm just jealous that you get to see it all in fast forward. That's cool. We do need to get some data from somewhere. So just grab the data lines from this test circuit. 
And finally, we do have an issue. The output lines from this demultiplexer are staying low. And what we actually need to do is just pulse it in time with the button push. So the value loads into the latch before the number increments to move the right pointer onto the next spot. This shouldn't be too difficult because we can just take the same pulse that's driving the counter and replace one of these enable lines. Let's see what happens. So that's a load and it's constantly outputting what's ever in the right location. So that's not a surprise, but we should be able to change this down. And let's store this value in. So now we've got two bytes stored. Let's continue with the pattern. Three bytes stored. And then we store our fourth byte. So now we'd presumably have a control line to actually push this out to some output lines. But let's uh, hit the read to say we've taken that and we want the next byte. Awesome. Next byte. And then the final byte, which is the last one we put in. That is great, that worked. First time as well. So obviously I could store that value repeatedly and then I'm only gonna get that back out. I've actually just pressed my read too many times. So you see the number here rose below zero and wrapped back round, which would be an error case. So if ever the output count here shows a number higher than the number of bytes we've got, we know we've either read too many or uh, written too many. Let's update the EDA circuit again. This time we want the 574 latch chips. I'm gonna do something different though. Now I've been using the SO form factor, but I'm gonna try making this with the TSSOP, which will look exactly the same in EDA, but they're gonna be quite a bit smaller. Okay, so I want to define my eight data inputs and my eight data outputs and replicate this eight times. I'm not gonna make you watch me do that though, because that's fairly obvious. What I will do though, is come down here to the right, fit that data right line also as an input to the 138. All that means is that before we increment, we bring this line high again to, uh, to trigger the appropriate right line to also go high, which will cause the data to be actually latched into the uh, 574. And the same trick as we're pulling there, we can actually do it onto this 138 to create a universal output enable for our module here. Right, so here's our four control lines. We need power and ground inputs to the module as well, but we'll worry about those when we come to lay it out as a PCB. But this is an eight byte version of the four byte buffer we've built on the breadboard. Okay, well, I am really pleased with this circuit. I'm also pleased I didn't try and make an eight byte version of this because doing the wiring for four of these latch chips was completely enough for me. So what I'm gonna do in the next video is take the schematic that we've built and turn that into a PCB, solder up a couple of the modules and hopefully put them to use in the UART. I'd be interested to know what you think of this method I'm trying of designing the schematic alongside building the breadboard circuit, because I think maybe it will make it easier to understand, but it also kind of breaks up that PCB development a little bit. There are sections of my CPU that I kind of wish I'd already done the schematic for because uh, it's quite a long time since I made the breadboards. Very much hope you found this interesting. Thanks a lot for watching. I will see you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye.